Hi there folks and welcome back. In our first lesson on parametric surfaces, I asked the following question. What would it mean to integrate a multivariable function over a curved surface? Right? We know how to integrate such functions over flat regions in the plane with a double integral, over a three-dimensional solid with a triple integral, and even over a curved line in space using a line integral. But what if we want to integrate over a curved surface? Well, now that we've spent some time talking about parametric surfaces and surface area, we're ready to formulate a definition. Now you might be thinking, Zach, why would I want to integrate over a curved surface? Well, here's a motivating example that's going to lead us to a definition. Suppose that f of x, y, z represents the charge density at a point x, y, z measured in coulombs per meter squared. So maybe we have some sort of an electric blanket or something that has electric charge running through it. And at every point x, y, z, this function tells us the charge density. We want to know what's the total charge running through this blanket. Okay, now let's think about this. The charge density function might be different at every point over this surface. So rather than considering the whole surface at once, let's restrict our attention to just one of these tiny little patches. Over this wee patch, the charge density function will likely be roughly constant. We assume it's going to vary continuously. It's not going to change dramatically over this tiny little area. So we're going to assume that throughout this patch, the charge density is roughly equal to the charge density at this point here. This point might be R of ui vj, so we're assuming the charge density is F of R of ui vj throughout. Okay, now to find the total charge on the patch, given the charge density, we need to multiply by the area of the patch. We need to clear this meter squared term. Well, we don't know the area of the patch exactly, but in the last lesson, we learned how to approximate it. The area of the patch is roughly the area of this parallelogram, which we can obtain using the cross product of these two tangent vectors. The area is roughly the norm of RU cross RV times the change in U, delta UI, times the change in V, delta VJ. This means that the total charge is approximately f of r of u i v j, the charge density function at this point here, times our approximation of the area. Okay, this is an approximation of the total charge on just one patch, and of course we have to add up the approximations over all patches. So our total charge is approximately the sum over all patches of this expression here. Well, I think you know what's coming next, right? We're going to let the number of patches go off to infinity. When the patches get smaller and smaller and smaller, our approximation gets better and better and better. And so therefore, our total charge is the limit of this nasty expression here, which hopefully makes you think back to our limit from double integrals. We saw a similar scary looking limit when we defined the double integral of a function. Well, it turns out that this is going to be equal to the double integral over all possible values of u and v, which maybe I'll just call d, of f of r of u v times the norm of r u cross r v d a, right? This delta u delta v term is going to turn into a d u d v, which is a tiny little area d a. Well, folks, this is going to be the definition of our surface integral. We define the surface integral of a scalar field little f over a surface s using this notation, the double integral over s of f times a tiny change in surface area, which I'm going to call ds. Okay, these s's are different. The s down here makes reference to the surface. I'm going to try to write it a little differently. And this s represents a tiny change in surface area. We'll define this surface integral to be this double integral. I'll make a few comments about this definition on the next slide, and then we'll jump into an example. Okay, we've just come up with a new type of integral, a surface integral. I have a few comments on our new definition. Firstly, the definition is very similar to the one that we had for line integrals. If we wanted to compute the line integral along a curve C of some scalar field F, well, that was given by this expression here. We plug in the parameterization 
multiply by the norm of r prime. r prime here is like the tangent vector along the curve c, and we integrate over all values of our parameter t. Well, the same is true here. We're plugging in a parameterization for our surface, multiplying by the norm of ru cross rv, which we know to be tangent vectors to our surface, and integrating over all possible values of our parameters. Secondly, I want you to think back to our lessons on double and triple integrals. If you compute the double integral of the constant function 1, you get the area of your region. If you compute the triple integral of the constant function 1, you're going to get the volume of your solid. For a line integral, if you compute the line integral of the constant function 1, well then you're going to be computing the integral from a to b of r prime t dt, but that's exactly our expression for arc length. So the integral of 1 there is arc length. For surface integrals, the integral of the constant function 1 is, well, according to our definition, this expression here, which in our last lesson we saw was the surface area of s. Finally, if you compute the surface integral of some type of a density function rho, maybe it's charge density, population density, mass density, whatever, that's going to give you the total amount of that quantity throughout your surface s. We saw that on the last slide in terms of charge density. Okay, cool. Let's jump into an example. All right, I'm going to wrap up this video by computing my very first surface integral. The integral of z squared over this surface s, the unit sphere. Where do we even begin with a problem like this? Well, if you think back to the definition, we need to know a parametrization for our surface in order to compute the surface integral. So the first step is to parametrize the unit sphere. Well, we've seen this several times before, right? We can parametrize it using spherical coordinates. The distance to the origin is constantly going to be 1, and so our parameters are going to be phi and theta. We'll parametrize it using the function r of phi theta equals, now we're going to use our conversion formulas, sine phi cos theta, sine phi sine theta, and cos phi, and since we're going over the whole sphere, phi is going to range between 0 and pi, and theta will range between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, now we have our parametrization. What's next? Well, according to our definition, this surface integral of z squared over s is given by the double integral over all possible values of our parameters, phi and theta, of our function, which in this case is z squared, times the norm of r phi cross r theta dA. I can't compute this integral until I know this norm. So I guess we're going to have to take this parametrization, differentiate it with respect to phi and theta, compute the cross product, compute the norm of that cross product, and then integrate. Oh my goodness, it sounds like such a process. Well, hold on a second. In our last lesson, we went through this whole process of finding the norm of r phi cross r theta for a general sphere of radius a. We found that that norm was a squared sine phi. So in our case, we already know that this norm is going to be 1 squared times sine phi, which is just sine phi. Now this is amazing. This is why we went through this ugly computation in the last video. When dealing with a sphere from now on, we don't need to do the computation again. We can use this result for free. So by replacing z squared with cos squared phi and using these bounds for phi and theta, we get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi, of cos squared phi sine phi d phi d theta. Now this is a very easy double integral to evaluate. We can pull the theta integral out, and then for the phi integral we can use a substitution, and what you should get in the end is 4 pi over 3. Let's check out some more examples in the next lesson.